uh, it was a little challenging when I got the topic of this presentation and the time slot. It's the last presentation. People's eyes are glazing over with all these slides, right? And then the topic is email. Come on, email is so 20th century, right? I want to talk about Snapchat. I want to talk about Pinterest. I want to talk about WhatsApp. So I think I'm going to need a lot of support from all of you in the next 30 to 45 minutes to see if we can revive email. Are you guys with me? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So we're going to play a game to begin with. We'll talk about a few trends. We'll figure out whether that's a myth or a reality. And then I'll try to present a case as to why we need to revive email and how can we make it effortless. And I'll conclude with a true story. Myth number one, email is no longer the preferred contact channel for customers. How many of you guys actually agree with the statement? Can I have a quick show of hands? Not too many, wonderful. So I'm gonna show you some uh, studies. So this one's from Aberdeen Group. Uh, last year, 43% of the customers wanted to interact with voice and the second most favorite channel was email at 25%. Something that's even more recent and even more interesting. Uh, if you guys are in the online retail e-commerce world, you guys probably know Stella Service. This is a group that benchmarks the service experience provided by all the retailers. And they actually ran a survey, I think, earlier this year. This, this result was published maybe three months back. And the question they asked was a very simple one. During this upcoming holiday season, what channel would you like to interact with the online retailer that you're going to buy something from? And to me, surprisingly, 53% of the respondents actually chose email. Way beyond phone, chat, social media, and SMS. Yet another study, and this was uh, American Express. Uh, and they were essentially kind of looking at it at a more granular level. They wanted to see for different types of inquiries, what are the channels uh, that are preferred by the consumers? And what they found was that for very simple inquiries, and uh, not a surprise at all, email or web was, I don't know, twice or even more as likely than any other channel as the preferred channel of contact for the customers. And even when you went to kind of more complex or difficult inquiries, uh, email was right up there with kind of the face-to-face -face or the phone call as the second most preferred channel. So I think if I'm email, I'd like to quote Mark Twain and say, the rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated, right? <clears throat> so let's move on to point number two. It's okay to respond to customer emails in about eight business hours. It takes a day. I think it's still surprising to me when I uh, walk into some of the contact centers and I talk to some of the operational leaders and I ask them, what are your SLAs for email? Uh, we strive for eight hours. Sometimes we do it in 16 hours. Sometimes we, but I think there is still that perception that it is okay to respond to emails from customers in a day. And if you look at customer expectations, and now, one thing to keep in mind, we've, always, we've already been trained by the businesses that we deal with that hey, eight hours or 24 hours is okay. But even with that kind of, I guess the expectation, the poor expectation that has been set by businesses, about 45, 42, 45% of the respondents actually said they'd like to re receive a response in less than four hours. I think eight hours was okay when the 15 or 16 years back when the choice of channel was a written mail or an email, right? Five days to one day. I think when you get to email these days, I think the faster you can respond to customers, the better you can engage them on that channel. And we need to kind of almost change that expectation curve from the customers as well to kind of ensure that email continues to be a preferred channel uh, for these customers. Okay. 
This one should be very easy, right? I think, can I get a show of hands of the people who think that email is the cheapest channel? One, two, three, okay. Very few. So you do think that email is actually pretty costly, right? Uh, present you two slides here. So the first one is a, a study by Forrester. If you look at that, obviously self-service is an automated channel, much cheaper, but if you compare it against any other agent-assisted channel, on the surface it looks like email's pretty cheap. Uh, could be as low as a $2.50, and maybe for more com complex queries, maybe go up to $5 or higher. But I think the thing with email is uh, it sometimes takes longer to respond to actually resolve the customer inquiry because you may not have all the information in the first email. So the iterative nature of problem solving over email sometimes hides the sort of the cost of true cost of resolution in the email channel. So every email contact may be $2.50, but if you have to iterate a lot to get the information that you need to resolve the issue, uh, it's not very clear whether email is really the cheapest channel or not. This, I think, I mean, we, we are all consumers, and we, have, we all have our opinion whether we are kind of generally satisfied with email-based service or not. And uh, to me, this, this was not really very surprising. So if you look at, again, this is a study that compared the sort of the satisfaction with the sort of the website, the call center, the IVR, and the email. And it's a combination of essentially the amount of time it takes. And if you kind of think about the response times where businesses think it's okay to take eight hours, the iterative nature of getting to a resolution. So average contacts to resolve inquiry is 1.8. It's not very surprising that email's really at about 50, 55% satisfaction. Now, there are multiple such studies, but in general, I think you'll see the same trend uh, that email is not a, cust a channel that customers feel that they are receiving good service on today. So I think that's really part of the challenge that I'm trying to address in this presentation. I think we've established that customers still prefer working over email. However, they probably want a better response time uh, than what they get from the businesses. Uh, we need to reduce the sort of the average contacts to resolve inquiry if the email channel is going to continue to be effective. And that's really, I think, the thesis of uh, my presentation, uh, because even while you guys are sitting here, you probably have checked your email while I was talking. So email is here to stay, right? So how do we revive email? And I think I want to change the definition of email a little bit. I want to call it messaging. I want to include sort of the non-real-time contact channels, if you will. So let's include text in that. Let's include email in that. And let's kind of create an effortless experience for our customers so that they can get the value of the service experience that they desire on the channel that they prefer. So in the next few minutes, what I want to do is really talk about how do we make messaging effortless? And first thing I really want to talk about is kind of making messaging proactive. Uh, very often, we know uh, what, uh, the, that we are going to get a request, information request or a service request from a customer based on where they are in their customer life cycle, right? If you're a telco and you have just sold a new device to a customer, I mean, that many studies that show in the first two weeks, you will have questions about your device, you'll have questions about your plan. And, or if you've kind of just placed an order, and I, I think we are now used to, uh, people who use Amazon, we're used to kind of receiving those order status updates. Uh, but I think in order for messaging to be effortless for customers, 
the first and foremost thing is to really kind of anticipate those information requests from customers. And then kind of alerting them before they can even get in touch with you because then you're kind of avoiding a contact coming into your contact center, which is both costly. And as I think Lara mentioned earlier uh, yesterday in her, in her uh, presentation, that a service experience has a four times more of a probability to kind of make that customer disloyal versus not having that service experience if you can avoid it. Uh, the other important thing is sometimes you will need to take those inquiries from your customers and you will need to resolve them. So the most important thing in that regard then is to kind of make sure that your customers are framing those inquiries bat better so that you're collecting all the information that you need to do to resolve that issue up front. First contact resolution is Nirvana. And to get to that first contact resolution is really then making sure that you have all the information that you need to kind of uh, resolve that query. I think I want to make that plug for that four business hours or less one more time. I think people are used to, so the reason people go to social media is because they've sent you an email. You haven't responded to them. They've tried to call you. They've been waiting in the queue for 20 minutes. And what's the best way to get attention? It's really to, hey, let's tweet something. I think if businesses were able to kind of improve the response times on these emails drastically, maybe 15 minutes, maybe one hour, and customers have that expectation. Nobody wants, in this day and age, nobody really wants to wait for two days to get an answer to a simple question. And, and I think that's, that's really important as well. So we, we want to make sure that we continue to imp kind of make those SLAs around email response times way more aggressive. And the last point is really a funny story that, true story, but there is this hotel chain and you can, you can go into a website, you can fill out a form, and you can send them an inquiry, and you'll say, hey, I need to make a reservation. And two days later, you'll get an email saying, sorry, we don't let you make reservations over email. <laughs> right? So being proactive is also making sure that you're not accepting inquiries that cannot be handled on the messaging channel. I think if you call AAA, if you call your uh, host, uh, provider or doctor, and the first thing it says, if it's an emergency, please hang up and dial 911, right? The same thing. If you know that this is not a, a contact type that you can handle over email, when they're trying to submit that email or when they have sent that email to you, it's just kind of make sure that we get back to them and say, hey, if you really have this issue, we don't, uh, we don't recommend that you use email. Maybe this, there's a chat link that you send in there. Maybe there's a phone call or a click to call link you send in there, but it's not really acceptable to wait two days and then let the customer know, sorry, we don't really resolve these type of issues over email. So that, that to me is also a definition of messaging being proactive. Second dimension of making uh, messaging proactive, and no surprise, should be personalized. It should really be relevant to who I am as a consumer. It should know the products and services that I own or the services or products that, my, that I'm interested in buying from you. Uh, through the customer journey analytics and through all the other data that you have, you know what the past interaction history and the past interest is. You know what the, you can anticipate the needs of those uh, customers. And I think so again, to make messaging personalized, we need to kind of move away from sending these mass campaigns to sending more targeted offers through these messaging channels. I think uh, there is, a, again, a very interesting stat which says that 99% of the marketing campaigns, the emails that you receive, are not opened by consumers. On the other hand, 99% of the service requests that these customers make on the, on the uh, messaging channel, the response that they get back, they open them. And now, if you know enough about that consumer, and if you know, if you can anticipate these needs, and these could be service opportunities, these could be sales opportunities. And if we can start enriching that message uh, with those targeted offers, and again, 
I'm not saying these just have to be sales offers. This could be very well be service offers. I know that you have just bought a new phone and I know that you're gonna run into an issue setting up your email. So that, that's really kind of the relevance of information in the messaging channel that we can bring about to, again, make messaging effortless for our uh, customers. Uh, we have a lot of data about these customers in our systems. And we want to make these messages kind of more triggered by the life cycle events in, the, in, in that customer journey. So there are certain industries where there is a churn cycle at the end of every contract expiry period. There are other relationships which are maybe with a bank which are much more long lived. Or maybe there's a, a relationship that, that you have with your online uh, preferred e-commerce vendor. So depending on what the life cycle events are that are relevant to the consumer that you're trying to serve, you can again start making those messaging uh, responsive, uh, very, very specific to those life cycle events. Uh, value of customer, very important. I think we wanna make sure that, uh, I mean, that you are actually kind of giving a better service, giving a better level of service to your most valued clients. I think. Being somebody who travels a lot, uh, I, I, I truly appreciate when America, I mean, I truly appreciate even though American Airlines cancels my flight before I have to do something, they'll actually make reservation for me and I don't even have to call them, right? And that's the service that I get from them. And I think that, that even though nobody likes their flights being canceled, right? I mean, we hate it when we are sitting in an airport because there's a delay or something. But if I don't have to spend effort standing in line with everybody else at that time, it makes me feel special and I'm willing to forgive them. And I think that's, that's really the sort of the key message here. And to the extent that we know about what these sort of the contact preferences are and, and we are able to provide uh, service on, on that particular channel, I, I think it's important to kind of, again, make sure that the, somebody re likes receiving voicemail, somebody likes receiving emails, and that's perfectly fine. Another important uh, dimension on trying to make messaging more effortless is really truly making it integrated. So I think we've been talking about this a lot. Uh, even Chris in his previous presentation really talked about kind of harmonizing the, uh, the channels, and I'm kind of going one step beyond. It's not really about harmonizing the channel, but also harmonizing all the information, right? So customer information in any large enterprise sits in multiple data sources. We need to be able to integrate those data sources to construct the messages, perhaps as a single message. In some cases, it needs to be different, and that's fine. But it's no longer okay for me to receive 10 different messages from, my, from the same business that I have a relationship with when it would have been more effortless for me if they could have actually combined that into a single message. Uh, as I said earlier, I think definitely we want to kind of think about messaging as not just email, but any non-real-time channel. So text, voicemail, fax, even social posts, right? And uh, John talked about uh, knowledge everywhere. Uh, this morning, and again, uh, the cornerstone of a good, effortless customer experience is really that common core of knowledge. So messaging should essentially take the same nuggets of knowledge and then deliver them effortlessly to the sort of the customers at the other end. One of the things that actually very powerful about the messaging channel compared to the real-time channel is really the amount of collaboration that you can achieve to resolve a customer query. You have somebody in a chat or somebody on the phone, yes, you can transfer, yes, you can conference, but it's a real time, and sometimes it's kind of difficult to either get to the right person or sometimes it's difficult to kind of do that conversation in real time about how to resolve the customer query. With, with the messaging channel, you have the luxury to collaborate behind the scenes. You get a query from the customer and you know that, uh, hey, you, you may have seven different lines of business in your, in your organization. And this inquiry spans maybe three of them. 
you can, you can connect to the sort of the claims group if you're an insurance company, you can connect to the, uh, the I guess the reservation desk if you are in the sort of the hospitality business. And again, work behind the scenes, know who the subject matter experts are, and bring the response together so that you're resolving the customer query in one go. And that, that, to, that to me is really a great advantage that the messaging channel has over most of the other channels. If you, if you are able to then integrate this whole experience, data, channels, knowledge, as well as collaboration that we need, that's when messaging starts to get effortless for our customers. We all live in a world where we hear about data breaches, right? And the thing that worries most of us as consumers is we want to be very careful about the data that we share because we know that there are people out there who are trying to sniff that information. So it's perhaps way more important these days than it has ever been in the past to be able to handle that sensitive data, and I'm just gonna say appropriately, right? So depending on the type of interaction that you have and depending on the security you can provide around that data. So you have your personally identifiable data, you have your personal health information, you have your payment card industry data. I mean, and every, essentially every thing that's about you, you wanna make sure that the businesses that you're kind of working with will honor the privacy of that data. So we wanna make sure that as a business, if you're kind of providing service over the messaging channel, you are actually kind of handling all that data very, very appropriately. In some cases, you may want to completely mask the data and never store it in the messaging channel as well. In other cases, you may be required to share that data, but then you need to kind of come up with alternative mechanism on how to kind of share that data rather than in an unencrypted format, uh, which could be a text message, uh, or an email. The other, the other thing in this regard is really, I think most of us work in industries which are regulated. And if that's regulated, you wanna make sure that for audit and compliance purposes, it's something that you can actually store in a way that you can meet the requirements uh, when that regulatory authority comes and tries to kind of get information about the interaction that you had with the customer. And the last point, I think it's kind of becoming more and more prevalent these days. I mean, a few years back, there was this big debate about sort of native email encryption uh, or trying to kind of deliver that data in a secure portal in the web. I think the world's kind of moving more towards sort of the authenticated web portal or even smartphone apps where the data transmission is really kind of restricted and encrypted. Uh, because in the end, going back to my theme, it has to be effortless for the customers. If the customers are required to download know, encryption tools on their email clients, I can bet you that 90% of the people in this room will not do it. So, I uh, would love to kind of now present a case study from one of our customers. Uh, it's kind of implemented fairly powerful messaging platform for their, uh, for their clients. And interestingly enough, they call it the enterprise messaging platform. Uh, they had a situation where they wanted to, again, aggregate information and life cycle triggers for their clients that were happening in different systems into one place apply rules, honor the sort of the preference that the customer had indicated, and then send it out over the, not just the choice of channel of the customer, but in, uh, in certain cases, if they knew that that information was secure, then also kind of guide the consumers to actually kind of only get that information uh, in a secure channel. Um, the benefits of doing something like this can be immense. So they started off with their goals of improving the quality of service, right? I mean, I talked about what we need to do to make messaging more effective. 
And if done right, this is something that can actually increase the loyalty to a great extent. So they're very, so this is a slide I think that they shared with us almost five years back. And the first bullet point in their goal was really kind of enhance participant experience and loyalty. Reduce operating costs was number two. Increasing revenue was number three. And then using the messaging channel to start guiding the customers to more <coughs> self-service channels because they're both cost effective as well as effortless for the clients. And, and, and they achieved some uh, significant results. They converted about 7% <coughs> of the retail participants, the participants who used to go to a local drugstore to refill their uh, prescriptions, which is a costly channel for them, to mail order. They were able to incre increase the online orders by 10% within that one year pe period. So instead of getting the customers to call in, uh, and place their orders with a live agent, which is obviously a costly uh, operation, they were able to promote self-service uh, effectively so that the online orders kind of volumes went up. Um, I think they got about $10 million in annual savings and they're actually probably close to about 160 million messages that they send out every year through the sort of the messaging platform that we have uh, enabled for them. Okay. Time for this true story. And I think when, and, uh, when I go through this, I just want you to keep one thing in mind. Not one word in the story is embellished or exaggerated in any way, okay? This is something that happened to me personally a few years back, right? Started off very innocently. I got an email campaign in my, mailbox, said, hey. And this is actually, by the way, one of the leading brokerages in, in the US. So that's a four or five year old story. And this is the, one of the top three brokerages there, right? So on email, say, hey, if you open an account with us, we'll give you 100,000 frequent flyer miles. You like the offer? Just click here, right? Why not? Uh, it's a very rep reputable company. Uh, I'd love to get those miles and take my family on a vacation. Why not? So sure enough, I clicked on that link. Took me to a very generic account opening page. And I, I filled everything out. And I did not see any indication about where I could be kind of entering my frequent flyer number or anything like that. So I got a little worried saying, hey, if I open this account right now, will I get my 100,000 miles that they've promised me? So. <coughs> There's nothing on the page that indicated that. But then I saw a chat link on that page. So I said, okay, let me click on that chat link. And I, I did, and I got connected to somebody. And I asked them, hey, I'm, I received this campaign. I clicked on the link, I'm filling out the form. I don't see any place where I can associate my frequent flyer account. Do you think I'll still get the miles? Interaction took about three or four minutes and the chat rep at the end said that, hey, I've made a note in our systems. So when you go ahead and submit this application, we'll make sure that you get your miles, right? So that was dollars being spent, in my opinion, unnecessarily by the company to make sure that I, I would open my account, right? And then when I clicked submit, it's got a very generic message saying, thank you for your submission, right? No indication of how long it would take to process anything like that. So I waited patiently, five days go by. I'm like, uh, okay, what's happening? So I said, let me call and find out, right? So I call them and say, hey, can you guys tell me what the status of my application is? I said, sure. Uh, spent a couple of minutes and said, yeah, it's under processing, it'll maybe take two more days. I said, wonderful. Hey, I just want to make sure that uh, my, the, my account opening is really tied to the promotion that I received. Can you just confirm that for me? And the person says, mm, I'm not so sure. So I said, and by that time, obviously, I was starting to kind of understand what was going on. So I said, hey, I had a chat session with you guys when I opened the account. Do you guys, do you see the chat transcript? Uh, no. <laughs> so, 
So, so okay, let me, let, me, let me spend some more time and try to find it. Anyway, so spent another five minutes on the phone with him. And more dollars spent by the company for no reason at all, right? And then this is where the story starts getting even more interesting. I get an email from them maybe three days later saying, hey, we've been trying to reach you. We've been trying to call you. Can you call us back? <laughs> and obviously, I'd filled in my home phone number in the application, right? And uh, they were trying to reach me on my home phone during the day when I'm not at home. So yes, they could not reach me. So then I get this email and say, sure, I'll call you again. Why not? <laughs> and oh, even better. When I call them, they said, we need you to submit a signature verification form. So we want to send that signature verification form in the regular mail to you. Believe me, none of this is embellished. <laughs> this is what happened. <laughs> Right? So more dollars sending that form to me. And by that time, I'd completely, so two weeks had gone by. I had lost complete interest in trying to follow through on this transaction. I never opened that account. So this is what, what it can mean if you don't do the sort of the whole messaging right. Now, if you kind of think about the effortless version, and again, true story. Halfway through that process, I got a similar offer from a different brokerage. <laughs> and I have embellished this slide a little bit to just show what that effortless experience could be. But in the end, I ended up just opening the account with the second brokerage, right? So I got that same email, went to the same website. I was able to kind of provide my frequent flyer number. Wonderful. Got an email saying, hey, thank you for submitting the application. We know that you are interested because, because of the promotion, and we applied that promotion, and we'll update you on the status in three days. And then, three days or two days later, actually, I got a similar email saying, hey, we need this, you to fill this out. But it was attached to the email that I received. Now, this is where it's embellished. If it had been ideal in this world that we live in today, that it's all integrated to my smartphone app, and has an appointment that it uh, sets up for me. It gives me direction to the office I can go to get notarized. I don't have to spend that money getting that document notarized because their office is literally three miles from my home. So one of the things that I think as, we, as the industry solutions group was running that uh, case study yesterday, I thought that this would have been an interesting case study, but then I didn't want to steal my own thunder. <laughs> so I, I think this is really what we need to think about when we when we think about the messaging channel. We want to think about what the customer is looking for and how can we make it, again, think about the four dimensions. How can we make it proactive? How can we make it personalized? How can we make it integrated? And how can we make it secure? I think if we do those four things, I mean, email's not a channel that's going to die very easily because it's just so convenient for all of us. We can be sitting here in this room during this presentation and be conducting business with somebody else. And <clears throat> again, if you kind of think, if you expand email from just kind of email response management to the whole sort of the proactive messaging platform, then I do think that uh, we'll be able to kind of increase the customer satisfaction, the customer loyalty, all the good things uh, when we're kind of providing uh, service over the sort of the messaging platform. So what do you guys think? Did I succeed? Oh, thank you. So light a moment.